discriminate against you. Oh, it's not working? Oh, it was? Alright, well, I'm just going to keep talking just to keep there. Um, do you have any paperwork in your packet about me? Yes, Like a piece of paper that says that I've got R, subscribe, and three Okay, well, let's talk about that while we're working on computer stuff. So, um, that's the piece of paper that I'll be up here in your report organization before we go through the PowerPoint stuff. Um, the first thing that calls me for you to commit violations is that first R. And oh, Okay, so we're all back together. So the first R on your piece of paper is roll, and that's what causes employees to probably commit the violations more than anything. You have to remember that your access to patient information is granted to you in your role. For you guys, it's as a student. A lot of times I say your role as an employee. So just because you have access to something does not mean you'll be looking at it or abusing your access. Um, so if you have something done, if you want to look up your own test results, do you think that's okay? Not okay. What about your parent or your sibling or maybe you have a child? You think you can use a computer system to look that stuff up? You can't. The reason is, is because it's all about your role. So you cannot use something that's been given to you as a student for your personal life. Does that make sense? And so that goes for a lot of bad self assets, like you can't take home the otoscope to look in your kid's ear. You know, anything that's been given to you in a certain role, you can't cross-reference that into a different role. So that's the first R, and that's one of the things that employees uh, probably get in trouble to the most. And that'll lead right into our segue here into our presentation. So there are a couple of different laws related to patient privacy. One is called HIPAA, one is called tech. We call it all HIPAA, which is fine. And the general rule of thumb is if you can identify the patient, then HIPAA applies. So that doesn't matter if it's a piece of paper, it's a computer screen, it's um, a text message, a, a radiology film. If you can identify the patient, then that information is covered under the privacy regulations. So what is one of the best ways to prevent privacy violations? Don't identify the patient. So when you're talking out loud to your coworkers, you want to be sure and say, your fellow students, Dana Williams in room 303 you know, had an accident or something. So if someone cannot figure out who you're talking about, then it is not a privacy violation. Does that make sense? So limiting the amount of identifying information that you use is a reasonable precaution that keeps you from, prevent, from having violations. As a student, you're probably gonna take a lot of notes. So instead of taking notes and saying, Dana Williams, room 303, just write down my case number. If you have to have a, you know, something that can help you go back to what patient am I working with, just write down the patient's CSN or account number, whatever you want to call it. Because if you were to lose that piece of paper, then we don't have to, we don't have to tell the patient, hey, we had a student who lost your piece of paper. Because no one knows who that number belongs to. Make sense? But if you lose a piece of paper that says Dana Williams, then yeah, we're going to have to tell the patient that a student lost a piece of paper. We do see students lose things like notebooks and, and things like that, so you know, keep up with your stuff. But also, um, try to limit the amount of identifying information that you capture about the patient. Everybody good with that? And information areas you have access to solely due to your position in this situation as a student are considered sensitive and you should not exploit that. So, the government, and therefore back as health, and when I say the government, I mean the Office for Civil Rights, that's the arm of the government that is responsible for enforcing the privacy regulations. They say that there are only five reasons that someone would access, use, or disclose patient information. As a student, you guys fall into healthcare operations because it is an operation of the, of the hospital to grow more healthcare professionals. So your access, use, and disclosure is covered under the healthcare operations um, provision. But any access use or disclosure outside of this would be a violation. So remember, it is always important to remember your role. You're asking yourself when you're getting into the computer, does this have anything to do with my role as a student? If the answer to that is no, then you can't be doing it. When you're telling someone information, or they're telling you information, you need to be saying in your head, does this have anything to do with my role as a student? If the answer to that is no, then you're just gossiping. Does that make sense? That's, a, that's kind of how we look at it. And so I, I really hope I'm not coming across as being a bully or being too stern, but we really do want you to be happy and successful in your program, and to be happy and successful, you need to understand what we expect of you. 
And so this is me just trying to help you understand our expectations. So we have a variety of violations, but in my mind, they always fall into one of two buckets. We have a failure to verify bucket, which I hope you guys won't be involved with as much. But failure to verify is also known as I'm just too busy. So you're just not double checking, you're giving the wrong discharge instructions to the patient, you're giving them the wrong prescriptions, you're faxing information to the wrong number. Um, it's just you're not double checking your work. And just like we talked about limiting the amount of identifying information on the patient, um, verifying your work is a reasonable precaution. So if you give the patient the wrong discharge instructions, one day when you get out of school and become a full-fledged person, a um, medical person, uh, then you would be in trouble for that because we would have to let a patient know, hey, we sent your discharge instructions home with someone else. Does that make sense? I, I need some like, nodding and smiling. Okay, great. Especially for you people that I can't really see at all. Um, so, but what we're going to talk about mostly is emotionally driven violations because those are the things I think, especially as new healthcare professionals, that um, that you guys will have the most trouble with. So, how many of you have never worked in healthcare before? And this is going to be brand new. So, the majority of you have worked in healthcare before. Raise your hands if you worked in healthcare before. Oh, well, that's really wonderful. Great. You'd be surprised at the mix when I talk to different. I have groups of employees and how many people have never worked in healthcare. So hopefully this will not be news to you. We can just fly right through the material. Up next, the personal electronic device policy. Everybody say never. never. Like you really mean it. Never. Let me tell you what you are never going to do. And I mean never. You are never going to capture, store, or transmit patient information with your personal electronic device. So we have privacy policies and we have personal electronic device policies. You can look it up on EmployeeNet or on StudentNet, um, whatever you guys have around here. Um, but we do take it very seriously. So for no reason would you audio record, video record, or take photos of a patient. Now if a patient wants you to take a picture of them and you have time, you can, but it must always be with the patient's device. It can never be with your device. Now, if you use their device to take pictures, then you're responsible for the background. So you have to make sure there aren't any other patients in the background, or there's not a computer screen in the background. So while you can do it, it does come with a little bit of responsibility. So it's completely up to you. If you want to take pictures of the patients or their families, it has to be with their devices. Next up is if you want to be in a picture with the patient, you can if you want to. You do not have to be in pictures with the patients. Um, I always tell employees that it, it's all it's fine until it's not. You know, they love you until they don't. So um, we have seen some situations where patients are like, you know, don't get, if you go on the fourth floor, don't get Dana, she's horrible, all she does is text with her boyfriend, and she can bring me my medicine. And then they've got a picture of you that they're floating around on the internet. So um, it really is just a, a gut level decision about if you want to be in a photo with a patient, you'll just kind of have to you know, to use your judgment, um, but you, I just want you to know that you don't have to be in the photo. Does anybody have any questions about personal electronic devices? I like questions, just to be clear. Next up, let's talk about some violation examples. So we had audio captured of a patient. This was a situation where the employee, which always you can substitute the word student, the employee and the patient were not getting along, and the patient was complaining about the employee to the supervisor. So every time, um, so the employee decided that when she went into the room that she would audio record her interaction with the patient so that if the patient kept complaining about her, that she would have proof that she was not being rude to the patient. Does anybody think that is okay? No. Not okay. So um, has anybody already put it together that the patient and the employee know each other outside of work and they don't like each other? Yeah? Well, that's what happened. So um, what are some alternatives? What should the employee have done? What would you need to do? Yes, ma'am. She should have gotten a coworker and go in there. Yeah, get a witness. What's another example? Somebody over here, raise your hand. Ask to switch patients. Ask to switch patients. Definitely talk to your supervisor, talk to your teacher. If you have um, if you have something going on, you have some sort of beef or conflict of interest, definitely let your instructor know. I mean, maybe they can swap you, maybe they can't. But it's definitely important to be above board about those type of situations. Um, taking care of people that you know can, can be difficult. They can expect a lot from you. Um, they can want you to do things that you know maybe you shouldn't do, that you would do for a regular patient. 
And we want one of the things that Katie talked about is we want to make sure all our patients receive an excellent level of care, but we want all of our patients to receive the same level of care as well. Um, we have video taking during a huddle. So this would apply to you as well in your student capacity. If you have different activities, different labs or things that you're doing here um, in the classroom, you cannot um, capture, store, or transmit images of your coworkers or fellow students without their permission, okay? So it's not that you can't take pictures as far as I'm concerned. Your instructors may not want you to, so you should check with them. But as far as the personal electronic device policy is concerned, you cannot um, capture, store, or transmit images of people without their consent. Does anybody have any questions about that? No? Next up are photos of sensitive work areas. So if you can go somewhere that the public cannot go, then that's a sensitive work area. So don't be taking selfies in the bathrooms, the dirty linen rooms, um, the break room, the, the pharmacy. If you can go there and we don't let the public see that, then you can't be taking, you can't be capturing images of that and sharing. Does anybody have any questions about that? I'm gonna need a couple of questions. Just, I mean, just, just sprinkle throughout, just to keep it going. And then, um, so that happened, and then we had a student, so this is a great example because a student did this. We had a student who was also an employee. How many of you also work at Badges Health? Oh yeah, great. So you've heard this before. Yeah. Um, well, just as a reminder. So we had a student who's also an employee, and she took video of visitors from the neck down and posted it to social media. And she was kind of making fun of the visitors, like, you know, they had a limp or their clothes didn't match, and, you know, she's just being really hateful. So it was turned into me as a privacy violation, but it's not a privacy violation because the privacy rules only pertain to our patients, and these people are visitors. But regardless, when I talked to the employee, what's the first thing she said? She, well, she did. She said it was all in good, good fun. It was a joke. But she said, you can't see their faces. So I think she was listening just a little bit you know, when it came to um, orientation. But uh, because our actions were hateful, just not in the spirit of bad self or how we want to represent ourselves, not only was she terminated from her um, position at Baptist, but she was also expelled from the nursing program. And she did not get a refund. Because I was like, is she going to get a refund? And I said, no. So um, we take those kinds of things very seriously. So please don't try to walk the line between, this is not a privacy violation. I know I'm not, you know, I know kind of where I stand. Because it really, a lot of times, comes down to what's in your heart and how you're treating people and, and how you're representing um, Baptist Health and representing the school. Now, we did, um, I'm going to skip that example. It's too recent. You might figure out who it is. All right. So, how many of you have social networking accounts? Almost everybody does. It's a lot of fun. I have one. Um, I recently got on Instagram, so I'm going to find myself for that. Um, the... Um, employees and, and students, I guess, sometimes will ask me, does Baptist Health monitor our social media accounts? And my answer to that is no, we don't, but we don't have to because it's your coworkers who are monitoring you and your fellow students and those are the people who are turning you in. Because if you are aware of a violation, you're required to report it. You have to, if your coworker is taking pictures of a patient and posting them on social media, you need to let your instructor know. So it's, we don't have a system where we routinely monitor social media, but we don't really have to because you're going to be friends with people who also are in the field and those be, everybody knows right from wrong and somebody's going to turn you in. So the best part, the best thing to do is just to stay away from that. Keep social media in your personal life and then keep your professional life very separate. Okay? Next up, we have not had a substantiated social media violation since August of 2015. And I think that's because a couple of people lost their jobs, then word gets around, and it starts to ratchet down a little bit. But what we continue to see is employees disclosing sensitive business information. So they're not disclosing particularly patient's name and patient diagnosis, you know, a real flat out privacy violation. But we do see them disclosing some sensitive information, which is also against the policy. So let's go over an example of that. We had a situation in one of our regional hospitals where a child almost drowned and was brought to the hospital and med flighted and it turned out to be doing very well and was taken to Memphis and had a really good outcome. So the grandmother of the child took to Facebook and began and disclosed everything, the child's name, that she almost drowned, what they did for her, they med flighted her. The grandmother gave away the name, identified the patient, and gave away the clinical information. But then the employees began to post 
things like, you're so lucky you came in at shift change because we had two doctors. And one of our, you know, one of our nurses was a pediatric nurse from Memphis, and so she has a lot of experience with this. And then one employee said, yeah, and we just got a new crash cart because our old crash cart didn't have this specific measuring tape that we need for children. And so how we staff and the type of equipment that we have or don't have, all of that is considered sensitive business information. So when you're posting things on social media, you need to be asking yourself, is this the kind of thing that would be on the public website? If it is not something that's on the Baptist Health Public website, I would recommend you staying away from that. With the example, with the exception of you have a federally protected right to complain about your working conditions. I don't know if that officially applies to students because you're not getting paid to work, but um, for employees, you have a right to complain about your working conditions, like if they're unsafe. So um, I don't want to stifle anybody's um, civil rights here. You know, things are touchy up in Washington. So um, I, want, I want to be clear about that. Now, our, the Arkansas State Board of Nursing has a social media position statement. It's about 14 pages long, but it's really, really good. It talks about whether you should or should not be friends with your patients on social media. Um, it essentially discourages you, but also leaves it up to your professional judgment. But if you have a class, you need some paper to write, um, I recommend that you read that a position statement. It would give you a lot of really good information um, if you needed to write a paper or just for your own information. So we see a variety of violations, and we're going to go over some examples. The first one is that we had an employee post to social media and tag the patient at the patient's request. So when this was reported to me, and I spoke with the employee, what did she say? The patient asked me to. But what does the personal electronic device policy say? Never. You're never going to do that. So this employee gave posted photos and then disclosed a lot of clinical information. Now the patient was okay with her disclosing this clinical information, but it was very detailed and it was very personal. So this employee was suspended without pay for a week. So that was one of our initial violations. We also had a patient captured in a Valentine photo. So this was a unit where a patient comes very frequently and the employees have a relationship with him. And his wife had passed away and it was his first Valentine's Day to be alone. So the employees threw him a little Valentine party. And they had cupcakes, they had streamers, and it was super sweet. And that's the kind of thing that will get you in the huddle until you take pictures of it and post it to social media. So it was turned into me. Guess who turned it in? Coworkers. So I go talk to the employees and they say, oh, no, no. don't worry, we thought about it. We had him come 15 minutes early, so he's really not our patient. Do y'all think that's okay? It's not okay. I mean, he's a patient, we're a healthcare provider, it's the only reason he comes here. Now the patient could have taken pictures with his phone and then could have, it could have tagged, posted and tagged and done whatever he wanted, but the employee should not have taken photos with their phones. Does that make sense? Next up is when an employee's child posts to a new site. I always like to go over this example, especially for people who are new um, to healthcare because you'll be exposed to a lot of things that are you know, tragic and frightening. And so this is an employee who worked a very um, tragic case involving a child. And so she went home and spoke with her child about it. She never disclosed the patient's name, but she gave enough information about what happened to this little girl at the county fair and that she was going to have, you know, they're going to have to amputate her arm and that kind of stuff. So the next day, and she's just a cautioning her daughter, when you go to the county fair, you have to be careful. But the case, because it was so sad, um, it made the news. So the next day, the little girl sees um, this news story and she begins to post. You know, my mom works at Baptist, my mom said she's going to have brain damage, my mom said they're going to have to amputate her arm. So there are, according to the government, there are 18 different ways to identify a patient. And the, you know, the first 17 are very normal, name, date of birth, you know, DNA, stuff like that. Um, but the 18th way to identify a patient is any other information that could reasonably lead to the identification of the patient. So it's really just a catch-all for anything else that might be going on. So just because you don't disclose a patient's name doesn't mean you're not going to get caught up in a violation. So as you're working cases, especially um, things that make the news or other high-profile situations, you definitely want to make sure that you are extra careful with those. I mean, as a, you know, you're welcome to talk with your family about there were, uh, there were two broken legs today or we took out three gallbladders or whatever, you know, it's just some generic kind of volume information. Um, and share your experience with people, but you, are, you should not talk 
and any sort of specifics about a patient where people can figure out who you're talking about. Anybody have any questions about that? So this employee also crossed some um, personal boundaries with the family, professional slash personal boundaries with the family, and so this employee was terminated. Just stick on that one. And then we have also seen employees message patients to defend treatment. So in your role as a student, it is not your job, don't take it upon yourself, to intervene on our behalf. So if a patient or just a member of the public writes a bunch of horrible stuff about us, you just have to move on. You just, you just got to get over it. You can print it, take a screenshot, you show it to your instructor, you can send it to the strategic development department, they'll get with the um, department supervisor, program manager, and you know, the, someone can do some formal service recovery, like Katie talked about, you know, using the last model, but it's never, we have seen employees like, you know, pick up their sword and run to our defense and then get themselves in trouble by saying things like, um, you know, if, if someone says, your ER was terrible, I've never taken my dog there, and then the employees are like, we were really busy and we had a car wreck and we had a chest pain and you only had back pain and that's why you have to wait and that's how the system is built and, you know, we have a Christian mission and please don't talk bad about us on Facebook. Um, so that, that is not your role. Remember, we all, we're t what's most important to remember about today is your role and what you do as a student. Does anybody have any questions about social media? Okay. Violations based in emotion. So in my mind, all of these violations are based in emotion. Does everybody see that? So you got someone who's happy, you got some people who are feeling compassion for a patient, you have an employee who's scared, doesn't want anything to happen to their child, um, employees who feel like they need to defend us. So it's, you know, it's emotional. But what we're going to try to remember is that patient information is a tool used by the provider, but it belongs to the patient. And if you have feelings about the patient's information, you need to stop and check yourself. Because the patient's information is just like the computer, just like your stethoscope or your beakers. It's a tool that you use to do your job. And you should not have any sort of personal or emotional response to that information. It's also, you know, I think it's hard for us as healthcare people to understand that even though it lives in our computer system, that it really does still belong to the patient. We're just kind of the steward of it. And so just like you wouldn't use the patient's hairbrush or you wouldn't use their cell phone, you can't use their information. What is the only reason that you would use a patient's information? To do your job, which in your case is to be a student. Are we clear about that? Um, access to information is granted to your role as a student, and you cannot use the system for personal reasons, mother, caregiver, visitor, friend. But let's talk about what sometimes students do. So raise your hand again if you work for Baptist Health. Okay, so that's a few of y'all. So I'm talking to y'all. We see employees, students who are employees, employees who are students, however you want to say it, mix up their roles and mix up their user IDs. So when you're at work, Baptist Health employees, you use your U number. And when you're a student, when you're doing your student stuff, you use your S number, right? Y'all still get S numbers? Anybody? S number? I think you're going to get an S number. So sometimes the computer, we have a new auditing system, which we're going to talk about. The computer will say, why is this, why is this employee looking at this stuff? And then when I go talk to the employee, she says, oh, well, that's some of my schoolwork. I was trying to... You know, after class today, I was just looking that patient back up and I was just trying to see what I missed or just trying to study up or maybe I have clinicals tomorrow and so I went ahead and was looking at the patient's chart to prepare myself for clinicals tomorrow. And so that's not okay. One, it gives you an, an unfair advantage over your fellow students who are not employees. Does that make sense? Somebody nod? Yeah. Um, and it, then it confuses the auditing system. So remember, you're only going to use your U number in your employee activities, and then you're going to use your student number in your student activities, and you're going to keep those very separate. Everybody clear? All right. And that's in your handbook. So that's not just for me. That's also in your handbook. The discipline policy. When we discipline um, students, usually, I mean, theirs is a little bit different, but it, it's, it falls in line with this. If we don't have to tell the patient what happened, written counseling, we do have to tell the patient what happened, written warning. If you've done anything that is malicious for personal gain, financial gain, or access of a protected class, you'll be suspended from the program and likely terminated from the program. So
So if you are using patient information against someone in a custody hearing, a divorce proceeding, um, you're trying to get somebody arrested, you're stalking them, um, any of that kind of stuff. You're looking up your boyfriend's social security number so you can hack into his AT&T account, see who he's texting with. Any of that, none of that stuff is going to be okay. And that did happen. She was like, because there, the employee said that she thought you couldn't look at patients' clinical information, but that demographic information was okay. So to be clear about that, all of the patient's information is only to be used to do your job. So just their demographic information is still covered under the privacy regulations. Um, let's talk about access of a protected class. So any patient who has a communicable disease, a mental health problem, or substance abuse problem, they're considered protected class under the law. Therefore, they're protected class under a policy. So that will ratchet up your discipline. Um, your intent when you commit a violation does not factor into your discipline. So just because you didn't mean to find out that the patient had HIV or you didn't mean to find out um, you know, with something that was going on, that doesn't really factor into it. If you were snooping, you were snooping, and then there'll be some consequences associated with that. Now, we haven't terminated, we don't terminate a lot of people for privacy violations. Um, but the last two violations that we had, uh, the last two terminations we've had, both relate to um, protected class patients. So one was an employee who found out that his high school flame was in the hospital, so he accessed the record, he, that was like, he was like 30, um, access the record to find out what was going on with the high school flame, found out the high school flame was newly diagnosed with HIV. And then he told somebody who called the patient and said, hey, I heard you have HIV. So um, that employee was terminated. Then, um, then we had an employee and a patient who know each other outside of work. It's always tough. You need to get yourself reassigned or something. An employee and a patient who know each other outside of work and they got into an argument in public in front of a bunch of people, and the employee disclosed that the patient had a sexually transmitted disease and a history of abortion. So that employee was terminated as well. Um, so none of that stuff is okay, to be clear. I give you the examples so that you understand that we're not being unreasonable. We're not out there just terminating people left and right for little minor things, because I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to not do whatever it is you need to learn. You know, use the computer system to its fullest, to learn how to be a great healthcare person and take great care of people and make the most, I mean, you're paying a bunch of money to come to school, you know, make the most of that experience. But be sure that you are only accessing, using, or disclosing patient information to satisfy your requirements as a student. Everybody clear? Okay. Next up, oh, breach notification. Depending on what you do, we may have to tell the patient what happened. And that's called breach notification. We have to tell them within 60 days. All um, violations that require breach notification, because they don't all, only certain violations require that we tell the patient what happened. Those are reported to the Office for Civil Rights, and then they investigate us. And that's always great. Um, what's most important about breaches is that they damage our reputation and they impede our mission. So the patients have to know that when they come in, they're going to get great clinical care, be a bunch of people around, there's going to be some, really, there's some smiling students who are eager to learn. But they also have to trust us. And if the patients don't trust us, then they don't come through our doors, and then we can't complete our mission of changing the way healthcare is delivered in the state of Arkansas. Anybody have questions? When patients get our breach notification letters, it either makes them furious, and they send our letters to like seven on your side, or they take pictures of them and post them to social media, or they post them to our you know, social media accounts. Like, thanks, Baptist, for your, this letter that says that somebody was in my medical record for no reason. Um, or it really scares them. And so we had a patient um, who passed away in the emergency room. He was a very elderly man. So we had to send his breach notification letter to his wife, and she was elderly as well. So she called me, and she had convinced herself that there was only one reason why an employee would snoop in her husband's record. Because it was really just an employee who was bored, who was reading medical records during downtime on the night shift. So it was picked up in the audit trail, and she was terminated. Um, it's been like three years ago. So um, what would be the one reason that she, in her mind, decided that someone would care that her husband had died? To now that they knew that she lived alone so they could come and rob her. So she installed a security system at her house <laughs> off her little social security check because one of our employees was bored and reading patients' medical records. 
And so sometimes employees, and you know, a lot of you hopefully will come to work for Baptist and be an employee, they will say, it seems kind of strict, like written warning, I mean, that seems kind of strict. But we do take privacy and security violations very strict, and it, we are consistent. Um, I, it's important to me that the rules are applied fairly and across the board, and um, so we don't make exceptions. If we have to breach notification about something that you did, there's the, the student equivalent of a written warning will happen to you, at a minimum. Everybody clear? Okay. So, disclose, closing thoughts. If you disclose or cause to be disclosed, if you identify or cause to be identified, then the violation is yours. Patient information is a tool used to help you do your job. Um, privacy violations can have a lasting effect on your employment future. If you are kicked out of the nursing or any sort of program for privacy violation, then you would not be eligible for hire. You know, that would be a big deal. And if you're an employee and you're terminated, then you're not eligible for rehire anywhere within the system. Um, and corporate compliance, and if you also, if you, after you get out of school, if you have a license, we'll report that to your licensing board. And so we've seen former employees get into trouble with their license. But we are here to help you. We'll come and talk anytime. Um, when you get to your new departments, we're happy to help. If you have, if you have more questions, you want me to come, we want to talk in a small group in a classroom setting where we can ask a lot of questions. Be happy to do that as well. Does anybody have any questions before I show you some pictures? No? Okay. Now these pictures are confidential, so don't be taking photos with your phone. Be clear? What about this picture? So it's not a violation, but what if that computer had been up? Then it would be. That would not be okay. What about this one? So this is not a privacy violation. This is not even bad as hell. This is UAMS, I think. I shouldn't say that. But um, a person sent this to me, sent this to the compliance hotline, and, and guess what they said? Who's taking care of the patient? <laughs> and you know, you kind of have to, you have to think